In 1899, three lighthouse keepers off the coast of Scotland vanished without a trace. The scene left at the lighthouse was boggling, prompting a number of theories on what could have possibly happened to them. Today we discuss the curious story of the Flannan Isles Lighthouse. This is Red Web. Welcome back, everybody, to Red Web. It's another Mystery Monday. I am Trevor Collins, and with me is Alfredo Diaz. We've got another disappearing episode for the Disappearance Month. So they just got in a bow and hopped away, right? That's Is that how what that you went think? down. Is that what you think? Oh, man, there's going to be, like, evidence of do, blood. Do, 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 or do, do, do. Might have been, like, a fight or something. Or... Maybe two men were consumed down to the bone. And then the, the third final guy oh jesus bulked up out of his mind floated away bulked (laughs) bulked up out of his mind (laughs) yeah he uh he was a cannibal then did some push-ups and yeah and rode away ripped shredded eight pack yeah i'm I'm interested into getting into the details like i don't know how big this lighthouse little island was and Mm -hmm. um, and what the what the mysterious circumstances seem to be like what was left behind was it like right. food on the stove etc cetera, etc yeah. cetera. it's definitely interesting so what i'll do is i'll break down the kind of history of this lighthouse the way they operate who was on the island blah 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 and then we'll go into how the ship that was passing in the night how they kind of discovered that something was amiss on this island before they then figured out that people were missing uh but yeah let's dive into it So the Flannan Isles Lighthouse was first lit up on December 7th of 1899, so quite some time ago. It sits at the highest point of the remote island Aelin Moor of Flannan Isles, part of the Western Hebrides or Hebrides uh, or Isles of Scotland in the Northern Atlantic Ocean. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm sure there's a lot of proper nouns here in this episode that have a, a beautiful Scottish accent on them. I'm definitely going to be Americanizing a lot of these words. Yeah, good luck. So forgive me, my friends from the UK. But yeah, so we're working on some of the islands just to the uh, the west of Scotland there. The Seven Islands are also nicknamed the Seven Hunters. And even before the disappearance, many of the locals were very superstitious of this area, in particular, Aelin Moor, the island of the lighthouse, due to the paranormal energy that seemed to haunt the island. It was actually nicknamed the other country and some shepherds would bring their sheep to graze in its fields believing that this island and its grass could heal even the sickest of sheep that maybe it would induce twin births so you could have a bigger livestock more quickly but they would never stay the night that was where they drew the line because it was considered unlucky so it's interesting that this island has a a paranormal history that balances between a positive hey uh, we're healing your sheep and a don't stay there too long because it's also unlucky sort of thing. Yeah, the yin and yang, right? Yeah. So yeah, I could see that. So there's you know, there's a lot of cultures and whatnot that believe if there's a great evil, then there's a great good. So that's kind of the vibe I'm getting from that. Yeah, yeah. that's true. But uh, they say many spirits haunted the island, in particular the Phantom of the Flannan Isles. Other visitors that would come to see the island would actually circle about in a ship they would go around the abandoned ruins of the St. Flannan's Chapel. And while doing that, they would be down on their knees as some sort of maybe ritual, superstition, what have you, to basically show homage to this haunted place. But either way, the island had many bothies, and a bothy is a small hut or cottage, usually left unlocked and available for anyone to use that you could pop onto the island and maybe stay in one of these small shelters if you were so inclined. And the lighthouse, as you were asking before, is about 75 feet tall, or 23 meters if you prefer. And the hill that it sits on is about 150 feet tall, or 45 meters. And there's a railway track that runs up that hill that transports goods all the way up to the lighthouse. So that way there's not a whole lot of trekking back and forth. In 1900, the year after it initially opened, the Flannan Isles Lighthouse was operated by three men who resided in a small house on the island. The people that we're going to be talking about are James Duckett, the principal keeper with about two decades worth of experience. We have Thomas Marshall, the youngest and secondary assistant, and Donald MacArthur, who was the relief keeper, also known as the occasional keeper. 
MacArthur was substituting for the original keeper who had to leave Flannan Isles due to an illness. But regardless, these are the three folks that we're gonna be talking about right now. But in general, this island, this lighthouse has three keepers that would stay on the island for six weeks at a time. Then they were given two weeks off and a fourth person would rotate in as a relief keeper during the primary keepers two weeks off. And so that's kind of how the structure of yeah. how they keep the island. Rotate in for a little bit, rotate yeah. out. Now the person that was sick, is there any like mysteries or anything like that to the sickness or was it just like, oh, just blue? I don't think there's anything superstitious around it. It might have oh, just okay. been- Probably just a simple cold or basic illness. Yeah. Maybe this man saw something and he just didn't mm. want to say. He's like, I saw blinking eyes in my window and my window's a hundred feet up. Mm. <laughs> so those are our three protagonists as it were. But yeah, let's go back into how this whole scene was discovered because it's a remote island. You got these three folks and if they disappeared and they were left to their own devices, it could be weeks before anyone would really find out. But as luck would have it, another ship was going by and this was December 15th of 1900. And again, this was only a year after the lighthouse was first lit up. There was a steamer ship called the SS Arctur that was traveling from Philadelphia to Leith, Scotland. And when they wrote in their logbook that the Flannan Isles lighthouse could not be seen in the poor weather. Now, obviously that's what a lighthouse is intended to do is in mm -hmm. indicate, hey, there's, there's land here. You might not have visibility, but you can see, yes, we're over here, stay clear, or come harbor, whatever. But the Arctur crew did not inform the Northern Lighthouse Board until much later than this date that they observed this activity. For posterity, the NLB is the authority for lighthouses in Scotland and the Isle of Man. So those would be the people to tell if a lighthouse is totally out. That's a pretty big danger. <laughs> yeah, the, the point of a lighthouse, keep that light on, ships make sure they don't hit it. Right. Not doing a job, kind of pointless. Kind of pointless. But uh, they were unable to send a relief ship until December 26 due to that bad weather that I was mentioning before. The Hesperus was that relief ship and it arrived around noon on that day with provisions and a lighthouse keeper. As I mentioned, you know, they cycle people out, mm -hmm. but the crew saw that there was no flag on their flagpole and no one on the island responded to the ship's signals. So that was obviously the warning sign right up top. The red flag right out of the gate. Joseph Moore, the primary assistant returning from his leave took a boat to shore to check on the keepers, basically saying, okay, why is there no flag? Why aren't they responding? Let's get over there, let's just see. When he got there, Moore found that the gate and front door of the quarters had been closed, and after going inside, he found that their beds had not been made and their clock wasn't running. All the morning duties seemed to be completed. Some sources also indicate that there was an uneaten meal at the kitchen table and that there was a chair that was overturned but again, that's that's hard to uh, solidify. That's definitely out there, but we don't know that piece for 100% fact. I think there's a very important key fact there was that all the morning duties were taken care of. Yeah. Initially, that tells me that like, okay, this is this happened after some time after a, the, the breakfast or the morning. But then again, now that I'm really thinking about it, who's to say it wasn't just yesterday morning or the morning before? Who's to say? I, I doubt there's anything that really indicates that it's that morning, you know, the morning of. I mean, that's a good point because uh, we have some information to come that basically will clarify this, that it wasn't the day that they disappeared. Um, so it's interesting that they did in fact note that some of the, or all of the morning duties had been completed, but you're right. Was it that morning or is it every morning? Was it, yeah. you know, it, it is a little bit of a, of a misdirect because there is some information to come that will indicate Nope, that morning they weren't there, probably. Probably. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. If there's like a tally that they mark every single day on a calendar or something. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, that's just a little piece of information. That was a big chunk to my little puzzle here. No, yeah, 100%. But Moore, who was investigating this scene, the first person on site, later reported that, quote, the kitchen utensils were all very clean, which is a sign that it must be after dinner some time that they left. So again, now we have a little bit of a confusion here, just as I'm just a regular guy hearing this information for the first time and I say, okay, the morning duties were done, but food on the table, chair overturned, but after dinner now, like, I guess if I don't know what the morning duties are. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing, so. It's, okay, 
if they're morning duties, mm -hmm. you got to do them every day, which means by the end of the day, they're probably obviously not done anymore, right? Whatever that is. Washing yeah. a window, I don't know. Anyway, let's just keep moving on. But it's interesting to note for sure a little bit of the conflation yeah. of, but he's, I mean, he's just picking up what he's seeing. I mean, mm -hmm. he's just going observational, which is totally fair. The keepers couldn't be found in the lighthouse tower either. Like the, he just couldn't find them anywhere. Obviously this is a disappearance episode, but uh, he looked up and down the island, just nowhere to be found. And with this information, the Hesperus crew started to search for the missing keepers, as you can imagine. The captain of the Hesperus sent a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse board to say this, quote, a dreadful accident has happened at the Flannans. The three keepers, Ducket, Marshall, and the Occasional have disappeared from the island. The clocks were stopped and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. Ooh. So again, this is all reactionary. This is all based on what they're seeing. And so I guess we are kind of living this in their real time, which yeah. is maybe why it's so confusing. Oh man, right, the island isn't that big? It's not that big, no, yeah. I don't know, I guess, it, I'm wondering if it'll come up, if there's some kind of like emergency life raft or something like that, that isn't there anymore. Maybe. Cause in my head, I'm like, what? what is going on? What is the evidence that it's like, something tragic has happened. But then again, if the island's so small and they're not there, where the hell are they? You know what I mean? Like, right, where could they go? You yeah. can only assume something bad happened. Well, we'll get into the investigation to kind of dig into some more of the uh, the symptoms, more of the clues, but more stayed behind on the island, along with a few other crew members. Thankfully, God, I can't imagine staying on that island. Oh, these guys no all disappeared. Way. Just leave me here. Yeah, I just, uh, <laughs> just come back with the authorities. I'll just be chilling right here. I'll chill. I'll chill. Maybe they come back. Maybe the ghost will bring them back. Hell no. Exactly. Now, imagine being on that island, by the way, and looking out into the ocean, and it's just foggy, cloudy, stormy. You would feel like you were in genuine purgatory. Yeah. Some wild stuff. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I don't know. I would think that that would mess with you mentally. Oh, just yeah. Just being out there on a small island in and like just light and dark and light and dark, mm -hmm. light and dark. A simple life, a cursed life, mm. a half life. <laughs> so he stayed behind. <laughs> he stayed behind with some crew members to get the lighthouse working because obviously that's a danger that it's off. I mean, that's the whole intent of it being there. And again, I'll reiterate, they searched all over the island, but Duckett, Marshall, and MacArthur were nowhere to be found. So let's jump into the investigation and kind of some of the, the things that they noticed around the island after having mm -hmm. looked over it. So the lighthouse was working and full of fuel. Now they got it up to speed, everything's good. We don't know how recently it had been fueled up though. So the fact that it is full of fuel does stand out, but it's it's hard to say if like they did that and then disappeared or if it, you know, you don't really, we don't really know when yeah. um, it was fully fueled up, but hey, fueled up, ready to go, it's on now. Their relief ship then arrived at the Eastern landing platform of the island, which was in total working order. The Western landing, however, was damaged very extensively. And I'll talk about some of those damages. We have the tackle box, which usually sat at about 110 feet up above sea level or 33 and a half meters. It was gone, missing entirely. The ropes that were contained in the box were strewn across the rocks. The iron railings that were at the landing were damaged and some were even torn up from the concrete. So something incredibly powerful must have hit these Jesus, things. Jesus, yeah, tearing through concrete. Yeah, pulling these metal railings up out of concrete. Like Neo in the Matrix when he's fighting Smith. That kind of business. He rips that sign out and starts swinging it around. Mm -hmm. It's cool when he actually, boom, hits him in the chest oh, and yeah. just oh, yeah. breaks. Explosion. So maybe Neo was here. There's a life buoy, because you were talking about that. Was You're like, is there a ship on yeah. the island that they could have left on? Okay. Well, this isn't a ship, it's a buoy, but you know, it's a flotation device of some sort. It was ripped away from the railings and it was clear a human could not have done that, obviously, just by the nature of, well, the physics of it, right? I mean, it's just something powerful hit this thing. Damn, they get hit by like a bad storm or something? Like, damn. I mean, it was stormy, 100%. So like, that's definitely in play here. And, and I don't know how hard waves can hit, but I feel like that is entirely on the pretty, table. Pretty hard, yeah, Yeah, I would, I would assume. And the turf at the top of the cliff, which is about 100, uh, 200 feet up, was torn away. And so that's, that's the extent of the damage there at the uh, western landing. Another thing of note when looking over the island was that Moore saw that only one oilskin coat was still hung up in the keeper's quarters, meaning that wherever these keepers went, or wherever they are, 
one of the three did not have their coat with them in these very harsh December conditions, right? December weather in Scotland Oof. is nothing yeah. to be trifled with. And so that's why they have these weather resistant coats. And so the fact that one is still hung up either indicates that they left in a hurry, that they didn't intend to leave, or that they were so scared or whatever that they just left it or forgot it, right? Because the other two were taken. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. Because, uh, oh man, I've shot some stuff overnight and it'd be like 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm, ooh, it's too, way too cold for me. Mm hmm. Now you're on a rainy, windy island. Oh, man. In December. Like, like ugh. You'd think that'd be a priority. So I guess this person really didn't have time or the opportunity to get it. Exactly. I think that that alone says a lot about yeah. the circumstances of their disappearance. Mm hmm. You know? Little bits and pieces here are, are telling me storm and like urgency. Yeah. Sounds like some sort of massive wave is what's coming to my mind. Right yeah. Now. That's where my head's at right now. Yep. Well, flashing forward a few days, we have Robert Muirhead, who was the NLB superintendent. So he's like, listen, all right, we're on the case. We've been made aware of this situation. He comes to the island on the 29th to help investigate. He hired the keepers himself, so he is intimately aware of the situation and, and the, the folks at stake here. And he considered them to be very hardworking and experienced keepers. As I mentioned, one of them had been around doing this stuff for 20 years, so obviously he had a lot of confidence in them. So this is very strange. He arrives on, in person to investigate. He had visited the island himself as recently as December 7th and wrote that he had, quote, the melancholy recollection that I was the last person to shake hands with them and bid them adieu. So he's saying he was there not only like oh. three weeks ago, and he was saying something in my soul was telling me that I would be the last person to see them alive. <clears throat> I don't know why he, he looked back on that. Maybe it was hindsight. Maybe he's just like creating that memory. I feel like that'd be a hindsight thing. Definitely. But man, could you imagine... Oh god, like going on to a flight and someone just being like, "Huh, this feeling is like what? What, are you about? what feeling? I don't, I don't know. I just, just got this feeling that I don't know, it might be the last time I see you." I'd be like, "All right, oh! I mean, oh, get me the hell out of here. Like, get no! me. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not taking this flight. <laughs> uh, yeah, no way. It's all good. Never Let's mind. hope he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, dude, I mean, I've been around the block enough now in my extensive 30 years like that I've learned that when you have a very strong gut feeling like that, I mean, there's gut feeling, which is like, it's instinctual. And then there's gut feeling, which is you subconsciously picked up on something that you weren't, you didn't like look at something, but your eyes picked up on it and glazed over it. Yeah. As the head of the Northern Lighthouse group or whatever, branch I, I forget nlb essentially mm -hmm. he might have in his experience picked up on something that was going on whether it was weather whether it was personality whether it was circumstantial to the island the infrastructure what have you he might have just picked up on something and just wasn't consciously aware of it and all that is to say is task force you ever have those gut feelings pause mm. reflect think about it you might have yeah. picked up on something that you didn't really know about or notice and then run like the wind and then run dude <laughs> Unless it's a bear, in which case, I'm sorry, Oof. there's no out. <laughs> oh, God. So anyway, yeah, back to uh, to Robert Muirhead here. He investigated their clothes and discovered that the coat, most likely of the three individuals, belonged to MacArthur. And that's probably based on size and just condition of it and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The lighthouse also had a logbook, and you were talking about this. Maybe there was tally marks in a calendar? Yeah. Well, they have a logbook, which is very helpful, but also, just like last episode of, of The Disappearance, can be very confusing because uh, of the missing information. So anyway, this logbook was kept by Duckett and it contained information about weather conditions as well as the supplies that were on the island. And the last update was on December 13th. So that would indicate that maybe around that time that they had disappeared. Now, traditionally, before this information is written in the log officially, it is written temporarily on a chalkboard slate. That slate contains the most recent information from the keepers. And so it's not an official log, but you can look at the slate and say, OK, this is something that is basically a rough draft that's going to be in the log. So right. in the investigation, they're inclined to find that slate and see if they can glean any other information. 
Well, from that, it seems like they turned off the lighthouse the morning of December 15th at 9 a.m., again, according to this slate. So it is an unofficial log, but it is written down by the uh, by the keepers. Now, this is the same day that the ship before, the Arctur, would pass Eileen Moore. Muirhead believes that the keepers would have disappeared on that day since the lighthouse never came back on. And so this is how he kind of triangulated when they disappeared based hmm. on all the information. Yeah, because then if they were still there and everything was even mildly kosher, you think it'd be turned on. Something would be logged down. Right. Anything would be logged or any there'd be some type of indication at uh, for anything, any way beyond that point. Absolutely. And I'm just thinking about this now, you know, we, we talked about how the lighthouse was fully fueled and... I'll be honest, this might surprise you, but I've never kept a lighthouse and, you know, (laughs) and I don't know if you have to shut them down in order to refuel them. I don't know the the anatomy of a lighthouse or certainly an 1800s lighthouse. And uh, so maybe what happened and maybe why it was full was December 15th, shut it down at 9 a.m. Sun's nice and bright. This is a safe time to do it. Refuel, get ready to reignite. Something happens within that time window that they are able to refuel it, but then they are subsequently disappeared. And so that's why then you come to the to the 29th, land on the island, fully fueled, lit up, investigation continues. That's the that's what my brain wants to put together. Yeah. But then it leaves you with, okay, what could have happened in such a tight time window where, you know, I don't know how long it would traditionally be down for or whatever, but a little tease here, there's some more information to come around the lighthouse being shut off and being shut on. So Ooh. Or shut on? Is that a word? Uh, turned on. But yeah, yeah, we shut it on. Man, hey, could you take those lights and shut them on? I don't know what you want from me. Uh, um, another thing of note, though, and this is what kind of gets rid of my, not entirely, but kind of uh, shakes up my my little internalized theory. The damage to the Western Landing was noted in Duckett's log. So my gut wanted to say, hey, maybe they were at the landing, giant wave smashed into the place, off they went. But apparently, Duckett was around to have witnessed the damage happen, and he put it in his log. So he was around for whatever powerful thing, storm or otherwise, and he mentioned the weather, but it's just interesting that he mentioned the damage and not necessarily what did it or or if there was anything out of of the ordinary, you know? I would think not, because then why wouldn't you write that down? Right. If you're thinking it's like a giant octopus, like, threw its arm up. Oh, man. In an aggressive water twerk, then... <laughs> <laughs> that octopus was then throwing I had, it back, I, Man, dude. I would write that down. <laughs> like, this octopus was slinging its arm left and right. <laughs> this octopus coming from the island from the back. <laughs> <laughs> I saw oh. nothing. I couldn't see its eyes. I saw nothing but its back. <laughs> I saw nothing but the back. It was terrifying and beautiful. <laughs> I'd write that down. Yo, I would be... I would have taken a photo... I would have whipped yep. out my old school slate camera and I've been like, line that thing up. <laughs> Dang, wild. Yeah, that, okay, so yeah, that, that is weird. That's a really weird piece. Yeah. I mean, you took the time to write down that damage has happened. Well, let's be real. I don't know if he, like, if he sat down, lit up a nice, like, moody candle, licked the tip of his quill and said, Dear Diary, today, I, I don't know, like... If it was chicken scratch and just went, holy crap, this thing just got destroyed. And then he got ripped out the window by this giant octopus. Like, I don't know what condition under which he wrote this, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess. I would think it would be, like, destroyed. And I would just want to put water, monster, spirit. I don't know. That's fair. Because that reads like a log. If you like, if you're in that much of a hurry and it's that chaotic, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not in the moment. In the moment, maybe... Who knows? Like in the moment, <laughs> if, if things are popping off, why write in the book? Period. You know what I mean. But if I'm yeah. gonna take the time to write in the book, then I'm gonna write a word to try and like get me there. That's what I mean, dude. These logs can be so helpful, but I yeah. feel like they can also be so detrimental in a disappearance like, come case. On. It's like you couldn't give me like one word exactly. Just, it's what's ugh. missing that really goes ah. Okay. There's another thing that, and I want to mention that this is like, this isn't confirmed fact. I want to say that there are some sources that mention that there is a separate log that was kept by Marshall, who was the youngest keeper. But again, I want to reiterate, this hasn't been confirmed, but many sources reference this. So I do want to talk about it because this might change things. But in these supposed logs, Marshall wrote that Duckett had been uniquely quiet and that morale was low. 
And so maybe that has to do with uh, with Duckett's logs and the way he was recounting maybe what happened. Marshall's logs also made note of the bad weather conditions. However, this was not reported anywhere else in the area until December 20th. That is to say, this terrible weather that they faced and wrote down in their logs wasn't shared by any of the other nearby aisles until the 20th. So it's strange that they were unique in the area for a few days, potentially. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. One, that there was a second log. Potentially. Potentially a second log. And damn it, if there's a second log and there <laughs> isn't anything written about the details of what destroyed things, but... Uh -huh. But I mean, I mean, I guess like, I guess like how close would the second, like anyone else be that they would also need to experience the same said storm? You know that's I mean? a, that's a good question. We'll get to this in just a moment, but 18 miles is, uh, is another confirmed person. So you would think within 18 miles mm. that you would more than likely witness some of the same weather conditions. Yeah. 18 miles is not extremely far. Yeah. I mean, unless it's something like, like a storm. Yeah, you know, we've we've brought this up in a few episodes now, but unless it's something as localized relatively as like a, a cyclone, like a water spout. True, yeah, we brought that up. Is that Bermuda Triangle? Bermuda, and then last week uh, with the ship, that uh, the ghost ship. True, yes. Um, but yeah, coming back to this like, this uh, hypothetical log, and I, I'll just beat that into the, to the earth because it, this is very fascinating, but like we just can't confirm or deny it. But anyway... In this log, he also says that he supposedly witnessed MacArthur crying to himself and sometimes acting violently. Uh, Marshall's last log was quoted to have been, Storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. Now, historian Mike Dash wrote a detailed account of the Flannan Isles mystery, and these extra logs probably came from a pulp magazine, since personal opinions are not typical or not supposed to be. In logbooks, these are supposed to be very professional, very to the fact, because they are kept by many. They're not journals, mm. uh, and they and they make sure that keepers that come on the island can get up to speed properly. So that's usually why you wouldn't put opinions in here, and that's why he's thinking, yeah, maybe these aren't real. Maybe these were built to or fabricated rather to make the the story more interesting. But it's not impossible that the three lighthouse keepers might grow stressed on the remote island. So there could absolutely be some truth even if these were sensationalized, it does make sense that you could go a bit, you know, a bit out of your mind out there uh, in such isolation. Man, but their experience, I mean, anything happens in most, the most experience, but I mean. 20 years though, man. You're gonna know or not know yeah. in your four week stint if you're done with the game, you know? Yeah. But also that was just one of the guys. It could be the youngest one, you know? The youngest one was indicated potentially as crying to himself and perhaps violent. So, uh, and True. MacArthur going back now, Muirhead supposedly was thinking that the jacket belonged to the youngest one, MacArthur. So we're, we're, we're finding a little bit of a through thread here that yeah. maybe, uh, yeah. mm. maybe the young blood kind of popped off. That's true. Yeah. He, he was substituting as well. So yeah. Didn't even think about that earlier, but I feel like you're going to just the other shoe is going to drop and you're going to tell me something that just completely puts them in a different zone that isn't as suspicious. Maybe. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> well, obviously, there's no easy way to communicate with the lighthouse keepers being so remote on these islands. But that's where a person on a nearby island kept a lookout for any emergency signals from the keepers. Gamekeeper Roderick McKenzie was paid eight whole pounds per year to make note of whether or not he could see the lighthouse in addition to looking out for any sort of emergency signals. Now he lived on Gallon Head, which as I mentioned was 18 miles south. So it was his whole job to basically make sure that the lighthouse stayed on and that every now and then he would keep an eye out to see if any signals, any flares, what have you, were signaling danger. So he could then either step in to help or he right. could let the NLB know. So you're saying to yourself, all right, well, why didn't he say anything then? If the lighthouse was out, wouldn't he have said something? Not this ship that happened to be going by. Yeah. Well, when he was interviewed by the NLB, Mackenzie reported that he had not been able to see the light from December 7th until what? December 29th. So he's saying the lighthouse was out for 22 days. Obviously, what? the 29th is when the when the rescue crew or the, the investigative crew came and lit it. But the fact that it went down on the 7th is interesting. He was, however, able to see the lighthouse on for one day out of that time window, and that was on December 12th. 
So basically, we have this guy saying that, yeah, the lighthouse was off starting the 7th and didn't come on until the people got to the island and were investigating. The 12th doesn't really line up with any of the logs. Like, for example, the slate that contained the information that it was turned off, the lighthouse was turned off on the 15th. But it's strange that he said he was able to see it on the 12th, but it was otherwise off. So it's, it's really interesting to try to pull these dates together to figure out what in the heck might have gone on. Yeah. Also, was there no way to report that sooner? Or just like to report it to somebody? That would typically be his job. I mean, he is paid an entire eight pounds per year to do this. And he claimed that, you know, he was concerned about not seeing the light. Mm -hmm. But it's unknown why he never reported the information. I'm racking my brain to say, like, was it was it those weather conditions? He didn't say it. Was it that he was concerned, but he was preoccupied? It just seems so strange, and maybe this is why the disappearance is the way it is, that there's a man who is hired to keep watch from afar and let the NLB know. We have a ship who happens to notice that there should be a lighthouse where there is no lighthouse being on, and they also drag their feet in letting the NLB know. So it's like, are they involved in some way or like... Or, or was it just a comedy of errors? It's it's so strange. I'm, I'm just sitting here kind of like really stroking my chin trying to figure out these dates, but... I can't think of a reason why not, you right. know? Maybe they were just being lazy. I, I can't think of anything uh, nefarious as to why they would like purposely withhold that information for that long. Yeah. Because you think that like after a couple of days, it's like, okay, I'm gonna go report this. Mm-hmm. I don't know, that's weird. And I mean like... If it's his job to see this lighthouse, you know, obviously the 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 clear possible answer here is that, oh, well, the weather conditions were adverse. And so he couldn't see through the fog to the lighthouse. But I mean, that's the point of a lighthouse. But also, yeah. like, I don't know the radius or range of a lighthouse. But if his job is to be 18 miles away to see it, I imagine that he should see it pretty much always, give right. or take. Yeah. And what really stands out to me is that he goes, starting from the 7th, I didn't see it until you guys put it on. Minus, obviously, the 12th, Mm -hmm. but starting the 7th. So there's an overlap. So, like, he's saying it was out on the 7th. The logs go up to the 13th. There's more information on the slates up to the 15th. So there's at least eight days of the lighthouse potentially being off, but the keepers being present. And so you have to wonder... What, what's going on for this week that these professional keepers won't have this light on? Or is it just, again, some sort of like just comedy of errors? That's a lot of time, especially because like, I mean, it's a contained area. It's a very small contained area. Mm-hmm. So like those eight days are some long days. Jeez. Yeah, I, I, I can't piece it together. That's that's very weird. The fact that like someone's like, oh, yeah, my job is to like keep an eye on this. And, you know, my record show went out on this day and I didn't say anything like what a weird wrench. <laughs> right. That's thrown into this. To be fair, I, I mean, eight pounds in 1900 is not eight pounds today. So I'm being a bit flippant on that number. I don't know if it also is his full time job or if this is just like I have my job over here. He's a gamekeeper but I also get compensated to keep an eye out. So maybe it's just that like after many years of doing that, okay, no, it hasn't been many years. It's only been a year. So he can't even, so it's not even like realistic to say he's tired. It's been 10 years of this lighthouse being strong. Why bother, you know, on a daily basis? I just don't know. I mean, it's only been around a year. Strange. I mean, maybe they were neglecting their job and so That's why they didn't want to, I don't don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say, but this is a great segue because obviously this is the end of the investigation. This is the end of the hard facts, as it were. And uh, and so that leads us up to the theories, you know? I know. Damn it. This is one of those mysteries where there's so much information and nothing altogether. Right. It's so titillizing. I'm... I'm really loving just how shaken my brain is. I'm rattled just trying to piece what we have together. But that's what's so compelling to me about like and why we wanted to do a disappearance month. Like it's just so compelling to have people disappear in a thin air and try to figure it out. It's it yeah. it's obviously a just like a dark situation, but like uh, like people don't just disappear. So what happened? Man, a small contained island with a lot of timeline but none of it makes sense that's Mm -hmm. that's yeah that's a that's a weird one 
So, okay. December 15th, the ship passes, noting that the lighthouse is not lit. 15th is also the same day that, according to the slate, that they turned off the lighthouse. So that lines up. But this guy is saying it's been all for over a week at this point. Yeah, the fact that it was just for like a whole... I don't know, man. I did that... What was that person doing? <laughs> it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense. I want to go into the theory so bad, but I'm building literally a red web in my head. I'm drawing red string between these dates and I'm like, I feel like I'm missing something. It's like that quintessential moment in the detective film where they're like staring at the board going, I'm missing something. There's something here. Task force, if you if you're picking up what I'm missing, I would love to hear it. But without further ado, we should dive into the theory. So let's do it. Okay. Well, hello there, the task force. It's the one and only, the true, tried and true. You can look at me in the eyes. Look into your phone right now or your device in some way. Look at my eyes. See, I'm real. It's the real Trevor Collins. Uh, Here with a message for your ear holes, uh, including some fantastic sponsors. Sponsor number one, Red Web. An amazing podcast that you can listen to just about anywhere uh, <laughs> that you get podcasts. Did you know that we have a YouTube channel now? YouTube.com slash Red Web Pod. Red Web Pod. Man, we could have made that easier on ourselves, but we didn't. And we're never going to change it. Unless we do. I'll let you know. Uh, we have that YouTube channel for those of you who want a little bit of the visuals along with the podcast. And for those of you who prefer to consume your podcast on YouTube. We just want to be there for you. We know we have a wide variety of audience members. And we want to make sure that we can be in any little nook and cranny of the internet that you might visit. We also have store.roosterteeth.com where you can support Red Web by ordering some Task Force merch. Some good stuff on the way too. Talking about some pins. Talking about some, uh, there's some really cool merch. I need to, you know what? I need to get out there and start moving and shaking and making those merch things come to fruition because I I could use some more stuff. Anyway, I have some fantastic sponsors I want to talk to you about. This episode of Red Web is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Hey there, you're clearly a fan of high quality, fascinating podcasts hosted by interesting people. Uh, And since you like Red Web, you should check out The Jordan Harbinger Show. The Jordan Harbinger Show is a podcast that covers a wide range of fascinating topics through weekly interviews with heavy-hitting guests that reveal the workings behind so much in our world. For instance, Jordan recently interviewed CoffeeZilla, a YouTuber who exposes guru scammers, and Rene Duresta, who also uh, is another fascinating guest, and they study what turns ordinary people into conspiracy theorists. So they're right up our alley, right up our uh, niche, as it were. But there's episodes beyond this. They have episodes for everyone, no matter what you are into. We really enjoy the show, and we think that you will as well. So check out The Jordan Harbinger Show by going to jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations, or search The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B, as in boy, I-N, as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Candid. If you're looking to straighten your teeth, look no further than Candid. Some clear aligner companies work with general dentists, but Candid only works with orthodontists who create your plan and monitor your progress remotely from start to finish. You can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you or do everything conveniently from home. The average treatment is six months and it costs thousands less than traditional braces. Candid can help you get the straighter smile you've always wanted. Right now, you can save $75 on your Candid starter kit when you get started from home. Or you can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you today. Go to CandidCO.com slash RedWeb and use code RedWeb. That's CandidCO.com slash RedWeb with code RedWeb. That's going to let them know that we sent you. It's going to give you that $75 off. Take advantage of this limited time offer for your starter kit. 75 bucks off. CandidCO.com slash RedWeb and enter code RedWeb. Now with that said, let's get right back into the disappearance. So the most likely theory is that the lighthouse keepers disappeared due to an accident. This could obviously mean a number of things, so I'll expand. And for what it's worth, Muirhead and the Northern Lighthouse Board also agreed upon this theory. And the theory goes uh, as this. 
Marshall and Duckett may have been attempting to fix the damage that we discussed on the western shore, right? We have all of these mm -hmm. iron rails ripped up yeah. and a lot of things going on. Maybe they were trying to retrieve the tackle box, et cetera, et cetera. And then a rogue wave hit them. Now, when we're talking about this damage, it does feel like something natural happened. Uh, maybe a storm came through, maybe some rogue waves, blah, blah, blah. And when they thought it had passed, they had gone out to fix the situation or at least take inventory of what had happened. And then a rogue wave might have hit them, sweeping them off the coast. The theory continues to say that MacArthur may have seen the two from their quarters. And so, in a hurry to help, got up, forgot the oilskin coat, knocked over the chair that we discussed earlier, and barged through the doors to get outside to go see what had happened. And in an attempt to save them or figure out what went on or whatever, perhaps another wave may have swept him away as well. So it's a bit of a comedy of errors, but it is totally possible. Yeah. yeah. The lighthouse is also worth mentioning that it's near a geo. Now, I didn't know what this was, so let me define it for you. Mm -hmm. A geo is an inlet in the face of a cliff where water can easily explode out during a swell of waves. It's like a very narrow channel into a cliff face. And if a wave comes blasting through there, you might have seen against like sea walls. It just kind of shoots vertically up into the air. So since that is near the lighthouse, it's totally possible that even just taking a quick step outside, you could be swept asunder by some crazy waves. They don't even have to be like tidal waves or rogue waves in general they could just be bigger waves that are accentuated by this uh this geo yeah i mean that's a very straightforward like answer that's not crazy at all yeah you get a wave hit someone else went to go out there and try and help another wave hit and lost that sea 100 percent. yeah i mean that just is the we still have other theories to get to. I feel like this is going to be the most sound theory out of the bunch. Yeah, I, I definitely think that this one sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah, reasonable, straightforward. Yeah. But beyond that, I mean, you know, we talked about the damage to the iron railings and everything. Like, that is pretty clear evidence that waves had been already there, that, that waves had happened, mm -hmm. that had occurred, whatever. Uh, because, again... I don't think that the Hulk landed on this island before he went off to uh, to Trash Apocalypse or whatever that in Ragnarok. Remember when he? Uh, anyway, <laughs> yep. No. Uh, I don't think he made a pit stop here to rip up some iron railings before departing. So yeah, so there is some evidence of this being true. But in addition to that, I want to flash forward several years here to reverse substantiate this claim as well. Renegade waves have been reported and photographed in this area as tall as 300 feet. And if that were to hit the island, that would reach the top of the lighthouse. And these reports and photos come from Walter Aldebert, who was a keeper at Lane Moore from 1953 to 1957. In fact, when he was outside one time trying to photograph such waves, he himself was almost knocked off the island. And so now we have, oh. you know, decades later. Yeah. Some, exactly, right? It just kind of clicks. Decades later, more proof that these waves are just vicious and still relentless. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. I mean, in, in addition to waves, uh, many people have also considered the wind, any strong wind currents that might have blown across the, uh, the island and swept them off in that direction or in that way. But uh, when it comes to that, Superintendent Muirhead is not super confident with the wind being an option because of the direction of the wind. Uh, the fact that it was going west rather than going to the east. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it, was, it had to do with the geography of the island. But long story short, it seems that he remains confident on the waves accidental theory rather than um, you know, the wind yeah. or something else. I mean, it sounds good to me. It, it sounds very that's, good. That's uh, icing on the cake for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested into hearing the, the other ones, but yeah. yeah, I do this every time. I hear the first one, I'm like, man, that is good and sound. And then it just starts to get away from <laughs> me. So I, I'm right. too soon yet again. Well, as always, let's try to go through some of the wrinkles in this theory to see if we can shake it from its, uh, from its foundation. So, one of the bigger wrinkles, right? We have MacArthur in this theory, seeing this accident, maybe running outside to say, hey, how can I help? Well, if he's running outside and then being overtaken by a wave, in which case he's not coming back, why were the doors found closed is a question a lot of people ask when they say, okay, well, he's rushing, he leaves his food, leaves his coat, knocks over the chair, busts through the doors, 
turns around, gently closes them, and then he runs back out to go help. Uh, because yeah. when well, how do we know he didn't just slam the door shut? Or how do we know the wind doesn't just blow these things closed? Yeah. I mean, I don't know the door. Could be a door that doesn't latch as easily as the wind blew it closed. Right. But this is a question that some people do ask, because when the rescue ship, the relief ship came, and they came up onto the island, the, the door was closed. And so it made it seem that somebody would have intentionally closed it. And the last other wrinkle, and, and again, I do have to say that this is another weak wrinkle. I'd say maybe early 30s is what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, moisturizing on this one. Uh, the damage to the western landing was was included in one of the logs. <laughs> I gotta chuckle. But it can't be confirmed or denied whether the damage was involving the keeper's disappearance or not. So basically yeah. what I'm saying is the fact that it was in a log definitely does help substantiate that there are waves or some natural phenomenon that could do such a damage. But the fact is, they didn't disappear, write the log, and and then chuck the log back onto the land, you know? Like, yeah. so... Oh, man, I forgot... Mm. That's why I don't know if it's a wrinkle, man, because, like... But what, were, what was the exact terminology in terms of, like, what was written? Oh, in the log? Let me go check that. Yeah. But while I find that, like, if they looked outside, blasting away, these waves are tearing up the iron rods and, and tearing the dock apart, but then when it calms down, you're like, cool. Let's go figure out what just yeah. happened. Let's go fix this because this is our jobs. Maybe it's days later. I don't I don't know. They go out there. Boom! Another wave. I mean, you, maybe it's unpredictable. But yeah, let me find that log. And I can't find any pictures of the door itself, like a close-up image of the door. But I posted a link to what is probably the best angle of the exterior of the lighthouse that we're going to get, where you can kind of see the door. Mm -hmm. let, me, let, me, let me take a look at this kind of door shot. Yeah, get a get a get a look at that that kind of sort of would be door. Um, is it the one on the left that's kind of open? I think so. Yeah, in the bottom left next to what looks like that railing. Yeah, it looks like it opens in, which I think most external doors do, don't they? Mm. Opens in. Yeah, like it swings inward versus swinging outward. You know what I mean when you're opening the door yeah. from the outside. Because if it swung to the outside, it's susceptible to the wind. If it opens to the inside, all the windows are closed. Let me drop a big word. The pressure differential is not enough, maybe, to swing that door willy-nilly. But I don't know. You get a strong gust outside, mm. you get some lift on that door, it'll pull itself closed. I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, what was the right like like I said, what was the writing in the journal? Was it like was it talking about the waves and, and the issues with the waves? Pat, like beforehand? Like and now I'm trying to think of the tense of like which it was used right. to where that would line up with because maybe it was written earlier, and that's why. Yeah. So, Christian, I'm going to mark it in, in our notes here, because I have simply that the damage to the Western Landing was noted in Duckett's log, which then means it's an official log. It wasn't on the, the slate. It wasn't a secondary log by Marshall or whatever. It is a confirmed log, but I don't know if we have that particular language, uh, but it's a good question. We weren't able to find any official copy of the logs themselves, just details mm. of what the logs talked about. Gotcha. See, he could have talked about like the morning of or something. Yeah. Before they went yeah. out to go fix it or try to fix it. You might be totally right. It could have been like we woke up to the morning dew, right? We're going outside having our cup of tea. Yeah. Walk down to the dock as we always do to dip our tootsies in. And the place is like torn asunder by mm -hmm. the crack in itself. And, and then maybe in that moment while they were sipping their final sip. The sea swelled and swallowed them whole. And MacArthur dropped his eggs and he said, I'm on the case. And he slipped right in. He just, you know, he may, he may be even dove in. Yeah, that's all I'm, I'm just saying. I think that's a very good point. We don't know when this was written. Yeah. Well, let's see how this holds up compared to the next one. Because another popular theory is that some kind of foul play was involved with the Flannan Isles disappearance. I know we hinted at this a little bit, uh, but it has been theorized that a fight broke out between the keepers with one killing the others before they themselves fled the scene, maybe jumped into the ocean out of remorse or tried to leave in some way, because obviously they're all gone. Others theorize that one of the keepers may have had some sort of violent outburst or a mental breakdown due to the stress of keeping a lighthouse in such harsh conditions in a remote area, and that regardless of what happened, they are pretty stressful circumstances to be in, and that could have led to some sort of fight between them. 
I just they're veterans though. Like I mean I mean I get they're not immune to the situation. Been doing this for a long time. But again, there was the one young blood that was well, That's the thing. There's two young bloods potentially. Yeah. You know, James Duckett, as you recall, two decades of experience. Thomas Marshall, he's the youngest of them. That doesn't mean he has the least amount of experience, but he is True. young yeah. in the game. Yeah. Donald MacArthur was a relief keeper because he was filling in for somebody who had an illness. And I'm trying to go back in my notes here, but I do recall that in these hypothetical martial logs that were unconfirmed, they weren't, we weren't sure if they were confirmed or not, denied basically. Mentions obviously the bad weather, but also mm -hmm. mentions MacArthur sometimes being violent is what these theoretical logs say. And if they're real, if they actually did exist, then boom, we already have a bit of a smoking gun. And if they aren't, then I think it's someone trying to fill the gaps after a theory came out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like, if it, it all hinges on if the MacArthur logs were were real right. and not made up. Yeah. But uh, it's totally possible. I can totally see it. You know, being in this circumstance on a tiny island, I, I never saw the movie Lighthouse, but I imagine <laughs> it's something similar like this. You You might go crazy a little bit. Right. Uh, not to be flippant with the word, I mean truly, you, you might go a little stir-crazy being out on an island like that with not a whole lot to do and uh, the same old, same old. You know, I, I don't know yeah. uh, what, what it's like to be in a condition like that. Stir-crazy. Yeah. Low morale and everything. And again, I, I want to harp on the fact that Donald MacArthur was reportedly a violent person, sometimes resorting to fist fights in order to solve arguments, and that is beyond just those theoretical logs. That is Damn. kind of what is known of him. Right. And then coming back to Duckett, the principal keeper, the one who's been in the game for quite some time, reportedly did not even want to work at Eileen Moore, let alone the Flannan Isles in the first place. His daughter, when recounting the decision to go, claimed that he believed that it was too hazardous, especially for a father of four. And this could have contributed to the low morale. It could have contributed to a lot of the interpersonal relationships happening on the island, whatever they may have be. But regardless, it shows that, you know, he wasn't keen on being out there. Mm -hmm. Wasn't in a good mindset already going out. Right. So we're already brewing up like a, a not happy stew. And then circling back again to those martial logs, if we are going to consider them real for the sake of this theory, it's possible that the group may have been hallucinating the extreme weather because again, remember, nobody else in the area witnessed this supposed weather. The Arctur reported that the weather was, quote, clear but stormy on the 15th. We have the guy who's uh, a few miles away, who mm -hmm. is kind of like a backup guy who keeps an eye on the island. Didn't report on anything. Didn't report on anything, so we take his $8 back. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's the, the theory continues to go on as far as foul play. But I think the core of this theory is that there was some sort of interpersonal issues happening on the island, stirred up by morale and isolation. In a lot of ways, I think that's totally possible, but as I tend to do, I like to combine theories. It is totally possible that, you know, the lack of morale, the isolation, all of these things kind of go to your psyche. And if you're not very aware of yourself, if you're not very aware of your footing or what you're doing, especially if you don't want to be there, mm -hmm. accidents are much easier to have been had. And so you might let your guard down. You might do something that would otherwise be out of your nature as a veteran of this kind of thing. You might go out and put yourself in danger exploring something that like the dock that's damaged and a wave comes and hits you and you should have been like, ah, I wouldn't have done that if I was in my right headspace. That's the thing. You can't really predict the headspace. You know what I mean? I mean, they could be the right. most sound people possible. And then just one thing could just offset everything. Right. There could right. be some simple letter that they got a hold of and, and everything went to, to hell. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, there's just no way to kind of like pin that one down, even though it's a totally viable thing. Mm hmm. But as I mentioned, foul play can extend to a lot of different things. So I'll lightly touch on this one, um, you know, within the realm of foul play, a few people have theorized that foreign spies might have taken the keepers or that the keepers themselves might have been spies of some foreign sort. Foreign spies. All right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe at some point we get to aliens, but foreign spies wasn't on my list. We'll get there. What? What? Huh? what? what? What's the point? It's a little <laughs> lighthouse? Like... It's, it's, listen, I don't know if I'm going to, I'm going to extrapolate here because I don't have it in my notes, but what is the play? That's a very, <laughs> very good question. So let me try my best to improv one. 
foreign spies think that shipping is the great future of Scotland and that we need to, they say, choke their trade, their import-export the, ratio. The travel network that they have. Exactly. This is the internet of yore, right? This is the internet of the 1800s, shipping lanes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna populate every single lighthouse this side of Scotland, and we're gonna shut down all of them. Imagine all the ships crashing asunder. No one's ever gonna wanna go to Scotland again. Seems like the interns plan. Yeah. <laughs> but even spies yeah. need to have interns. <laughs> I don't know, man. Dude, I um, just, yeah, we will take over all of the lighthouses, and from there we win. <laughs> we will blot out the light. Like, um, no. Yeah. And I mean, kind of like very, very tangential to that. But some others have also theorized that perhaps these lighthouse keepers were taken by pirates. But as with all, all theories, I want to touch on some wrinkles like nothing was stolen. And going back to the original idea of foul play, there's no physical evidence on the island of there being a struggle. Typically, if people are fighting, you're going to find a broken mug. You know, you're not going to find one gently upturned right. chair and say, whoa, right. things Something. got wild. Something. Right. Um, so a lot of this theory, both a little bit more fun and a little bit more realistic, are all based a little bit more on speculation rather than evidence. At least as far as like even the logs are concerned, you have to presume that the uh, the martial logs are real because otherwise violence is not mentioned at all yeah. in Duckett's logs. With that said, let's dive into another popular theory, which is, you kind of nailed it, is that of some sort of supernatural event. Mm. It could be aliens that swung down from the heavens and abducted the crew, which is why they would have been left without a trace. Possibly, I know this is a bit wild, I know, I know your disposition on these things, but I want to cover mm. our bases, and I respect the theory. A giant sea serpent or some sort of giant bird attacked the island, which is why the dock was damaged, which is, again, why they uh, disappeared without a trace. I just don't think, given all of the clues, given all of the circumstantial evidence, that these are strong. Yeah, we, I feel like there would be more of a mess, you know? I don't, I don't think mm -hmm. that there was some kind of sea creature that would accurately strike to the point where there wouldn't be some sort of mess or evidence, you know? Right. Well, now I'm picturing, you know, the same scene as the wave theory, except it's the morning hours. MacArthur, the new blood, the temp, he's inside brewing up a pot of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm laying the scene, yeah, man. Yeah, lay the he's scene. Brewing up a <laughs> lay the he's, scene. Oh, hold on, he's brewing up a fresh pot, uh -huh. okay? Our boys doing their morning duty, mm -hmm. which is dipping the tootsies in the ocean. They like the way it feels. <laughs> They've got... Uh, hey! <laughs> Don't blame them. Blame yeah, the ocean for being that chilly. Detail, dipping the toes in the water. <laughs> they like the way it feels. They like the way it feels. It, it, the more context, see, this is going to be more realistic if I add yeah, these no, details. I could, I could feel, I could really, like, it's like I'm right, there, I can, you know? I can smell, it, this is a, a, a listen and sniff, you this know? This is insane. I can feel the breeze and smell the sea. <laughs> They're sitting there dipping their tootsies. They're on the dock on the western side. <laughs> A giant tentacle whips up out of the ocean and starts slam hammering down on the dock. Damn. Oh my God. Yeah. He gently, MacArthur gently sets the pot down. <laughs> he freaks out and gently tosses over the chair before running outside and closing the door. You don't want to let the heat A lot out. Of gentle plays going on here. Well, these are gentle boys. You don't want to break anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they like the, you know, they like the way the titsies feel in the water. He blasts outside and he goes, hold on. My dad would have said this. We're not heating the outdoors. Closes the door, doesn't want to let the heat out, and then sprints down to the dock to go, Oh my god, it's the crack and it's arrived, finally! It's taken my boys! And he's up on the hill, and and just as he puts his, his hand to his brow, his furrowed brow, to go, Where are they on the horizon? Another tentacle whips up and snatches him. Damn, before, that's it. Before leaving the rope from the tackle box where yeah. his feet were as a clue. No, that's it. That's what did it. Are you convinced now? No. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating though I, I i love these kind of theories despite you know you know we like to be flippant with things that's just who we are we're comedians but i love supernatural theories because aliens right yeah but also just because like i i love to hear the creativity that people have i love to hear where people's minds go to solve these otherwise like these are gaps in our history yeah. And you can solve them in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, you could you could force a circle peg into a square hole. It works technically, but I wouldn't take the square to the triangle. It, that one doesn't work. 
I learned that. <laughs> I, I, learned that I learned that a while I, ago. I'm, I'm looking over to the side playing with my geometry. <laughs> yeah, I was um, <laughs> you're look, still looking over like, mm, memories. Mm, mm, yeah. But another thing, uh, kind of expanding on the supernatural idea here, is that remember that these islands, by the locals' memories, I mean, th these islands were haunted. And this goes True. back quite some time as far as the locals history so there's a lot of memory regarding the uh, the history of these islands here and the phantom of the flannan isles aka the phantom of the seven hunters and they're thinking uh the locals i should say are thinking that you don't spend the night there you go there you heal up your sheep maybe get some twin sheep i don't know there's a lot of folklore going on around this place but you never spend the night and so locals are thinking that by spending the night, they incurred the wrath of the phantom that right. maybe a pirate ghost ship or some sort of ghost or phantom came through and took them away, punished them for disturbing the islands uh, overnight. It's, uh, it's a very interesting story regardless. Yeah, makes for an interesting uh, movie. Absolutely. And to kind of build on this folklore, as it were, I don't know if this is real or not, but locals in the area tell a story of three black birds that sat atop the lighthouse when Moore first arrived to investigate the scene. They think that these could be the three keepers that were transformed into birds as a punishment for staying overnight on the island. I would wager that it's some fanciful addition to the story at hand regarding the Phantom of these Isles. I agree. I mean, I get it. Just like a local tale. Yeah. I feel like I want to do a whole separate podcast or episode or whatever on just like local folklore. Yeah. Because... Like cryptids, that stuff is my bread and butter. That's I love fun. that kind of stuff. And then uh, in closing, as always, we like to touch on some smaller theories. Just one this episode. And this smaller theory that we don't have much to add on to outside of what we've already discussed is that perhaps the keepers chose to leave. Perhaps they had some inclement weather that smashed up the dock. And that's why the lighthouse was out for so long and that they left. And in their departure, yeah, whether say. they had a vessel of some sort, they capsized, they got lost, whatever, because obviously they didn't ever turn up again. But that is totally possible. I Again, you asked That's earlier true. on, I don't know if they had a boat or a lifeboat of some sort, but it would have been wise. But man, in those like crazy waters, instead of just waiting it out, it's yeah. definitely like an interesting choice, I'd say. You would need to have some urgency oh, to yeah. leave the island. I mean, maybe it was this giant tentacle squid that was ruining their toe dipping session <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta have a tds um <laughs> you know i it's, you're right something urgent must have happened in order for the, if this theory stands for them to want to flee the island in such a tumultuous time i don't know but that is the flannan isles lighthouse mystery the disappearance of three unfortunate keepers uh, we would love to know what you guys think. Maybe uh, maybe subscribe to the accidental theory with the waves coming through. I think, Fredo, how do you feel about that one? Do you think it stands? I, yeah, yeah, I could, I could, if I was to choose any, it's that one. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I just read at the bottom of my notes here, by the way, uh, 1971, the Flannan Isles Lighthouse became fully automated. Oh, that's so smart. we have <laughs> 70 years of potential disappearances on this island. But yeah, smart down the road, automate that thing. Right. Like, I mean, during those times, right, they didn't automate it because of either technology or it was just too expensive. But mm -hmm. there's no point now. Yeah. When I first read it, my brain heard 1901 instead of 1971. And oh. I was like, wow, this was so crazy. <laughs> they said, listen, we're going to automate this just now. But yeah, that's the Flannan Isles disappearance episode. We have another fantastic one next Damn. week. I'm going to tease it. Oh. We got some Roanoke action. Oh! Yeah! Yes! Okay. It's almost like one of a few reasons. Like, there's another topic we, we are probably going to cover, but... This is one of two topics that has, like, inspired me to do this disappearance month because, boy, is it fascinating. Oh. But, yeah, Fredo. Okay. You, Task Force, you guys will have to wait till next Monday to hear that. I've seen a show that covered Roaring Note. Um, you talking about American Horror Story? American Horror Story. Yeah. A lot of people didn't like that season. I thought it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. That, it, the show's certainly got weird since. Yeah. I think season one might be the strongest. The latest season is going to be a bunch of different stories. So I'm excited because they're changing oh, up. Oh, yeah. The, uh, either, yeah, they're changing up the, the, formula. the formula for it. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm waiting for that too. Uh, shout out, you know, maybe, may, hey, American Horror Story, you want to sponsor something? We got a show hey, for you. just genuinely like that show. That kind of goes hand <laughs> in hand with what we do. It does. Um, so don't watch it until we're sponsored, folks. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this has been Red Web. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, got to plug the stuff, but we have a new YouTube channel there. Now, if you prefer to listen to our podcasts on that platform, we have expanded. And down the road, we might expand our show into other series as well. Uh, we talked briefly about doing some sort of campfire side chat business, but yeah. I don't want to play my hand too early Who because knows? we have made no moves. But no, but we'll see what we get into. We'll see. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.